All right, this lesson is an introduction to Alexander Pope. And so we'll take a brief look at his life, um, also a look at his verse and the idea of epistolatory literature. And finally, we'll connect this to the learning, objection, uh, learning objectives and make connections to the project. So Pope lived from 1688 to 1744, um, you know, right around the time of Jonathan Swift, so late Enlightenment, I'm sorry, late Renaissance to early Enlightenment. And he lived and worked at a time in England when Catholics were subject to laws that were kind of similar to the Jim Crow laws of the American South, right? Catholics couldn't hold high political office, they were forbidden from marrying Protestants, they couldn't own guns, they couldn't rise too high in society. It was really a nasty time to be a Catholic, and Pope was a Catholic. Um, he also suffered from early health problems that left him, he was really dwarfed and his body was kind of crippled. Um, it was, he suffered from um, spinal tuberculosis, which is a rare disease. I mean, he's the only person I've ever heard of having that. Um, but, you know, tuberculosis attacked his spine and his nervous system and just left him small and, and with some pretty serious physical problems. And so, you know, he was very fortunate in, well, besides being a genius, but he was fortunate to live at a time when literature was just becoming something that people could do for a living. I mean, it was just getting to the point where people could read enough and books were cheap enough that you could actually make a living as a writer, right? I mean, as you know of your study of the uh, Renaissance and um, of the printing press, you know, if a book costs three hundred thousand dollars, you're not going to sell a whole lot of books, and you're, so you're not going to be a really successful writer. Um, but in this age of mass printing and greater literacy, a guy like Pope could make a living as a writer, and that's what he did. You know, he's a key Enlightenment figure, along with Jonathan Swift and Sir Isaac Newton, and so I really want you to see him in those terms. Now, Pope wrote in blank verse, which as you know from our studies of Shakespeare and our reading of Antigone earlier in Project 2, um, blank verse is unrhymed iambic pentameter. And Shakespeare's verse, uh, you know, Shakespeare's verse was, was, un, was blank verse. Um, like I said the, the version of Antigone that we read. Um, you know, and he maintained the tradition of poetry but with a more flexible, straightforward style. I mean, that was the beauty of blank verse, is that it wasn't so locked into rhyme like some structures, like sonnets are. Um, and so people could write much more naturally. And, and Blake is, you know, one of the last great blank verse writers as we move into the 19th century. You know, prose is going to become much more influential. And the selection that we're going to read from uh, his work entitled An Essay on Man is actually a, what we call epistolatory literature, right? And an epistle is a formal letter that is addressed to one audience for one occasion, but is written in a way that can be read and understood by a general audience. Um, you know, if you're familiar with the New Testament, most of the New Testament is um, St. Paul's epistles to, you know, Galatians and Romans and Hebrews and people all over the Roman world. Uh, we also even today have what we call epistolatory novels. Alice Walker's novel, The Color P Purple, is an epistolatory novel. It's a series of letters back and forth between these women in which the, the story is told. Right, so let's take a look at an essay on man and its structure. Um, this is some pretty challenging reading, and I'm going to give you a lot of help with this. Um, but I think, you know, if we understand the structure of it going in and, and kind of what he's going to talk about, it's going to make the reading, you know, more manageable. Right, so Epistle 1 of an Essay on Man is written in 10 stanzas. Right, and remember the stanza is kind of like a paragraph of a poem, although it's not like a po paragraph of an essay. So you know, we English teachers might refer to stanzas as paragraphs, but eh, it's a little different than that. But, you know, chunks of text broken up by white space. And in the first stanza, he greets his audience, a man named St. John, who is a friend of his. And in the introduction here, he's going to give his thesis. And his thesis is to vindicate the ways of God to man. Meaning that he's going to show how 
God's ways rule mankind. Then in stanza one, Pope kind of takes a survey of the universe and asks his audience where it, who made it and where it came from and who's in charge. Um, you know, he kind of takes a typical scientific approach to religion in the Enlightenment period. If you remember from our studies in history, you know, science is so important in the Enlightenment and it even kind of starts to change the way Europeans see religion. They kind of start to see religion through a scientific eye. In stanza two, Pope begins to point out that man's place in the universe is kind of minor and not very important. And this is very different from the biblical view that um, you know mankind is the most special thing that God created. Pope kind of points out that you know, no, you know, mankind is important, but it's just a part of the universe. Uh, stanza three, Pope points out that men really know very little. Um, and, you know, Europeans think they're so special, but, and that they know more than Indians, but they really don't. You know, he's kind of taking a shot at the Enlightenment that, you know, look, Europe, you're not that special. In stanza four, Pope tells his audience to be wiser and that if man questions God about his place in the universe, he's actually kind of acting like the fallen angels. Um, stanza five, I think, is my favorite one. It's just a devastating stanza. I mean, he personifies um, pride as this selfish little brat, really pointing out that the pride that's in all of us is just selfish and bratty. Uh, stanza six uh, and seven, there's a typo there, um, Pope points out that God has used nature to give all animal, has used nature to give all animals special powers and bodies. This is kind of a typical en enlightenment scientific view of nature as being perfectly ordered and designed by the master architect. I mean, sometimes you get language from the enlightenment of God the architect or God the engineer or God the scientist. Um, and, and it was really kind of trying to turn back humanity's view of itself that look, everything in nature is special and created for a special purpose um, and mankind is no different. Stanzas eight and nine, Pope just really continues to point out the evils of pride and how silly it is for man to question the perfection of nature and man's place in it. Um, you know, it's a sense of like, if God is perfect and the creation is perfect, then everything about human life is perfect, which is uh, an interesting conclusion to reach. Uh, and in the last stanza, stanza 10, you know, Pope gives us a very strong argument for humility and acceptance. And he ends with a very chilling and powerful and humbling line. He says, whatever is, is right. I mean, if the universe was created perfectly, then whatever is, is right. Um, kind of a hard thing to really wrap your head around. And so our learning objectives for this reading, right? I want you to get more exposure to blank verse, and I want you to get some exposure to epistolatory writing. I want you to get more practice interpreting figurative language, especially personifications and allusions. I want you to read poetry based on punctuation and not line breaks. And finally, I want you to analyze how figurative language creates meaning. Uh, and I want you to write an essay. You're going to write about Blake or Pope here and talk about figurative language. And so our connections to the project, right, is really this, this sense of hubris, right? And hubris is a classical Greek idea that, you know, pride leads to a fall, right? We see hubris in Antigone, between Antigone and Creon. They're both very hubristic figures. Um, to a degree, even Othello is very hubristic and having his pride in his manhood, and when that's damaged, he becomes violent. You know, and Pope really undermines the hubris of the Enlightenment. He points out that humans just aren't that smart or special, that humans are just part of God's, God's larger creation, and that humans should just be, you know, more humble and ex accepting of the way things are. You know, and he really goes against this Enlightenment idea that they're so special and you know, so much smarter than anybody who's ever been alive before and so much smarter than those brown and black people over there. I mean, that's that's kind of the way the Enlightenment was and people like Pope just really put it in check. 
And so that's it. And I've also posted an audio follow along video where, you know, it's going to be a boring kind of blank screen. And I'm just going to read the, the, the essay on man to you. Um, cause I want you to get a sound of Pope's poetry and it's, it's challenging reading. So I think if you have the audio support, it's going to make it much more manageable. Thanks for watching.